Hi guys, welcome to episode 10 of the One Small Change podcast. On today's show, we have the incredible Mr. Paul Brunson. Paul has been described as the world's most influential matchmaker, and most of our UK listeners will know him as the face and host of the hit TV show, Celebs Go Dating, which has just finished its latest season. Earlier in his career, Paul worked on a TV series with Oprah Winfrey, of all people, um, who described him as much more than a matchmaker, but more as a life coach. And from his CV, you can certainly see why. Paul is a serial entrepreneur, started his career as an investment banker, uh, and alongside his wife and business partner, Jill, has launched and exited three businesses. He's written a best-selling book. He's co-founded a university at the Bay Atlantic University in Washington, D.C., he runs his own podcast and community, Better With Paul, and he's also, uh, I believe, currently building a school in Jamaica with his non-profit, Give Love, Build Hope. And for me personally, I met Paul um, for the first time on the on the set of Celebs Go Dating, not looking for a date, my wife will be glad to hear, but um, filming an ele- electric toothbrush commercial of all things. Uh, and what first struck me about Paul was his incredible energy, his professionalism, but most of all, uh, the way he was able to uh, make myself feel very much at ease in a setting that I was certainly not comfortable in, um, but also the way that he engaged with the whole team. And, and that was something that really uh, struck me straight away. So I'm really excited to uh, to have this chat. Uh, we're going to go deep. We're going to be honest. We're going to be raw. And um, yeah, Paul, how are you, man? I love A. Hey. Can I say, I, I always, you know, being, I will say this, is, is that, you know, being on TV, you get interviewed, you know, quite a bit and you hear these introductions. And sometimes when you're listening to the introduction of yourself, you think, oh, oh I don't know about that. Or I don't want that. to. Be, oh, 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 oh. I loved it, man. I love that intro. Thank you. Oh, thanks, that, buddy. That, thanks. Awesome. How are you doing there? You're OK? You surviving? Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm I'm good. I'm good. I'm I'm in Washington D.C. today. Uh, we're actually flying back to London in a few weeks, uh, but oh, nice. it's sunny. The weather is incredible here in D.C. Uh, we have a new president. You know, things are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was thrilled to see that. One of the one of the uh, the few good things to come from 2020. Um, so um, so Paul, let's start. Um, I, I always like to start these talks at the beginning um, to a certain extent, and and for those of our listeners who um, who don't know you and even for those that you do, um, one of the things that I, it seems to become becoming a recurring theme on this podcast that I, t- I tend to gravitate to people who have made these big changes in, in their in their career choices. So as I mentioned in the intro, you started your career, I believe as, as an investment banker in the banking sector, and you've now made obviously a massive switch uh, into matchmaking and everything else that that's 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 gone alongside that in your in your diverse career and my wife I said that to my I said it to my wife this morning I said oh I didn't I didn't know Paul used to be an investment banker she was like oh yeah I assumed he would have been a psychologist or something like that so tell us <laughs> tell us about um how you made that switch and, and what the journey's been to, to where you are today yeah absolutely it was a massive pivot massive pivot yeah. Uh, is one of those where I am, um, to be quite frank, you know, I love the the, the brutal honesty, you know, of your show is um, I was very greedy, you know, going, you know, when I was a little boy, you know, through high school, uh, in college, my objective was to make as much money as possible, build an empire, become a billionaire, you know, that, that's that's all I wanted to do. And so I when I left college, right, our university, I picked the one job that I thought I could make the most money in. And that was invest. Like literally I looked at the list. I was like, okay, you know, an engineer makes 65,000 us, you know, Oh, but an investment banker with the bonus can make a hundred K, you know, that's what I want to do. And so I picked that career solely for that, uh, and spent a few years doing it. And quite honestly, I, I, I hated it. it. It was greedy. It was all of those things that, you know, we're really um, we're really not made up of what I thought my core values were. And there was a very pivotal moment when my boss at the time, he was having his first child. And he came into work opposed to going to the hospital with his wife. So his wife gave birth alone and he came to work and it was applauded that he came to work. And that completely turned me off. Um, but um, but I eventually got into matchmaking because 
I then, after working for an investment bank, I worked for a very wealthy family called the Ugels, um, who still run you know multi billion dollar business out of Turkey. Uh, they're my partners on the university here uh, in Washington D.C., and I managed their investments in the United States, and that's what I did, quote unquote, by day. But in the evening, because I'm Jamaican, have to have a lot of jobs, you know, I had. I had this nonprofit organization that helped that we, we tutored kids coming from low income households. And I realized that not one of those children had two parents in their household. They all lived with just one, you know, one person. And typically it was it was, a, you know, a mother or a grandmother or an aunt. Very little had male presence. And that's really what got me down the path of matchmaking. Because because people in the camp would joke me and say, Paul, you're so disturbed by this. Why don't you just become, you know, like hitch and just hook up all the parents. Right. But that idea really stuck. And it got to the point where my wife and I were hosting parties at our house for singles. Um, and then long story short, as I put on this business, my business cap again, and as I, I said, oh, wow, you know what? I have this idea, this concept where, you know, you could bring singles together. You could do it over games, you know. I want to take that concept and I want to sell that to in a, to a matchmaker. So I went to a matchmaking conference trying to find a matchmaker to sell the idea to. And when I sat in that room, just this epiphany came over me. And I remember thinking to myself, my gosh, I have such a unique perspective. I'm the only man in this room. I'm the only person of color in this room. I'm the only person under, you know, at that time it was under 40, you know, it, so it made me understand that I had something special to give to this industry. And that was that was 10 years ago. And I haven't looked back since. Amazing. And so so from there, you, you launched your own private matchmaking company. How did that lead to you? I mean, how did that lead to getting on TV? How, how did that whole process present itself? And obviously from TV at that time, you were based in Washington, then coming then being headhunted or for a UK show? How did all that come about? Yeah, it was it was very quick. Uh, and when you know, when I really reflect back on the story, now I understand the power of giving, uh, you know, without the expectation for return. So when we so after I went to that conference, I then quit my job working for the UGELs, which everyone's like, You're crazy. What are yeah. you doing? Straight away. Literally, I, I quit the next day. I quit. Wow. Um, and, uh, we had money saved up. My wife then liquidated her retirement fund, her entire retirement fund. She liquidated it. Wow. We used that as starting capital. And, you know, you being an entrepreneur, you know, the importance of having capital. I mean, cash is king. Yeah. And so we used that capital and what we did with it is actually, we used it to study the art in the science of matchmaking. I went and did an apprenticeship. I you know, read every book I could, went back to school for social psychology. And then we did something that a lot of people told us not to, and that was we opened up our doors for pro bono services. So for one year, we gave away free, top of the line matchmaking, wow. right? Top of the line matchmaking for free. So it turns out that one of the people we gave our services to, we didn't know it at the time, she worked for Oprah, right? That's crazy. So now, <laughs> it's cra isn't it crazy? So yeah. now, fast forward now, two years into starting our business, right? A year after we've given the pro bono services to her, we decide now to publicly announce we're going to become matchmakers, right? How do we do it? We created a web series called The Modern Day Matchmaker. And, and I and I and it's so funny because you could go to YouTube right now and go, and, you know, type in modern day matchmaker. It has very few views. Like it was getting like 10, 11 views every week. You know, it, yeah. it was coming out every week. And I knew my mother was watching nine times, you know, so it was one of those. <laughs> where it was only like one or two people that were probably watching this thing. Yeah. It turned out that Oprah was one of the people watching. But how she became familiar with it is that she was on her jet one day, you know, she had brainstormed an idea for a new show. She said it would be great to come up with, you know, we need a fresh voice. We need a different voice. 
The woman who we were providing services to is sitting on the plane with her and says, have you heard of this guy, Paul Brunson? Oprah says, no. She goes to Google, pulls up YouTube, and then she starts watching. And within about three months of us announcing to the world that we had launched our, our matchmaking agency, I got you know an, an inbox uh, from someone from Oprah's office. And within a year, I was collaborating on a show with you know, one of the biggest talents in the world. So that that part was amazing. And then over the next 10 years, I've every year for 10 years, I've had I've, I've been running my business, but I've also my I've had the best part time job in the world. I've been on TV. So I've had some type of TV gig and I've done every show you can imagine, you know, in the United States. And I'm still even I'm a contributor for our biggest morning show. Good morning, America, still, you know, here in, in the U.S., and then, you know, you were asking me about how, how I got to the UK is uh, four years ago, my wife and I, we had sold our business. You know, we, we, ha we, had, we had some, you know, we had some cash, you know, on hand. And we had decided that we wanted to give our boys, we have two, two young boys, we wanted to give them an experience outside of the US. And we were thinking about moving to Jamaica we literally were thinking about Jamaica. So we planned our, our year and we said, OK, in July, we're going to move to Jamaica. You know, we'll be there for about three, four months. We'll see how it is. We'll come back to the U.S. and decide what we want to do from there. Well, it turned out that, you know, there were some headhunters from Channel 4 and E4 who had reached out to me, reached out to my manager. And I ended up getting this job offer to go to the U.K. for the exact time period that we had plotted to be in Jamaica. So we said, OK, we'll just go to the UK. OK, London is cool. We'll just do London for three months. Um, and that was that was that was three plus years ago, almost four years ago. So we've been doing t television in the UK, you know, for the last three and a half years. So it's been an incredible ride. I mean, I've got so many questions to ask out of that. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much in there. But I think the first question that comes to mind is the Oprah thing. So you get this inbox from the, from her team. You've been doing matchmaking for three years at that point. Two two years, two years. Two years, yeah. Um, do, do you have a, an integral confidence about you? I mean, you clearly do. But has it always been there? And at that time, did you feel any sense of imposter syndrome at all? Because certainly, imposter syndrome is something that I feel on the set with you on that electric toothbrush TV advert, I had complete imposter syndrome. Um, but I imagine this sort of thing, it was, this was Love Town, right? This was this uh, full series with, with Oprah. Um, it must have been very daunting for you. Did you, did you feel that anxiety? I mean, how, how, how did it make you feel? Did you just have this integral confidence about you? Or, or were there certain practices that you put in place to, um, to give the, the confidence that's necessary in that sort of environment, I guess? That, that is a brilliant question. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question, actually, in 10 years. Uh, I was completely freaked out. Com I mean, think about this. My goal was never to be on television, right? I never did anything TV related. That's one. Secondly is I was only two years into a brand new career. And quite frankly, I was only one year into actually charging for services. You know, <laughs> the, the other year was just practice, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was completely brand new. And then here's the kicker. I get placed on a TV show with the biggest television personality in the world as a co-star. And I also have a co-host who is a 20 year veteran matchmaker. So she's been in, she's been in the space for 20 years. And yeah. I thought to myself, there's no way. And then on top of it, the emotional stress, because we had just given, my, I said, we, my wife had just given birth. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we did it. We're there. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I had to leave them for 45 days which is interesting because I just had to do the same thing. We'll come to that a bit, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to, to go film. So I was literally crying. I remember when they dropped me off at the airport, I was crying. I, I was legit crying. And uh, I was freaked out 
But I realized, and I truly, and I truly, truly believe this, is that that's the only way to grow. You must stretch yourself. That by definition is, is growth. And what I've tried to do in my entire life is put myself in situations where I am uncomfortable. And then when I look back, I realize how comfortable I have become in these difficult situations. So I, I was, man, I was completely freaked out, completely. And and did you just put a brave face on and and just in some way, I mean, in some, I know you've done, the, you've done the work and the preparation in the background, but in some ways were you just like, I'm right, I'm just going to fake it till I make it? Or was it just, um, did, did something just come over you and you just plowed on through? <laughs> You know, so I always, I've always, and I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but I always feel as if I could, I can study my way to uh, being at least good, right? So I'm the type of person, and I think you are this same type of person as well, where, uh, you know, if presented with something, so going to Love Town, for example, I know there's a scene happening tomorrow, right? And the scene is me and Oprah and, you know, my co-host Kaylin on stage and we're coaching someone, right? I will study all night. I will stay up all night. I will not sleep. You know, I will study. When I say I will not sleep, actually, let me be, let me be really transparent here. I'll sleep two or three hours, but I'll cut everything else out. No TV, no hanging out, no, I will fixate on preparing. And I also know the importance of not just preparing mentally for it in terms of the uh, the study, right? The, theor- the theoretical, but also in terms of, all right, let me make sure that my stress is down so I've exercised in the morning. Let me make sure I'm eating the right things. I'm not drinking alcohol the day before so that I get tired. You know, Let me put myself in an optimal situation and if I feel like I'm in an op, if, if I feel like I've optimized myself, I know I can at least be good, at least be good. And that's exactly what happened. And then my co-host, Kaylin, she got sick. About a week into it, she got sick. And so I became, so she was more so the lead. I was more so her junior, right? She got sick. I became the lead. And... And, and I'll never forget, and this is how one person giving you just one boost of confidence, one line can change your life, is I remember Oprah saying, you're, re- you're really good. Just, just that, just like in passing, like, yeah. you're, really, you're really good. I was like, oh, Oprah's just saying, I'm really good. <laughs> Oprah, I must be really good, right? It's one of those where it, 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 it changed my whole situation. I, I then brought on more confidence. I started studying more, you know? And yeah. so, um, yeah, I guess that is kind of faking it until you make it. I think that that is. That. Well, I mean, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, you'd, I completely agree. And you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with me. Preparation equals confidence for me. And I, I wouldn't, say, and people would be surprised about me saying this, but I wouldn't describe myself as a, as a naturally confident person. But same as you, I know that, if I know enough about the topic, um, then everything else I can I can make happen. As long as I've got that knowledge uh, within me, then then I can I can run by the seat of my pants a little bit um, and uh, and present something decent out the other end. So so yeah, I completely completely agree with that point. Another another tangent that I want to go off on this is, um, and you mentioned it there with regards to your wife and and having just had was that was that just having your first son at that point. Yeah. So so you so your wife just had your first son um and then you're off for 45 days. I mean r- run me through how that conversation goes. Is was your wife fully on board? Was there a big discussion like how do, how does that work? Cuz I know personally and I know Megan won't mind me saying this. Um we have a number of uh heated debates shall we say around me taking on too many opp- what I would view to be opportunities. Uh, and, and I'm fully aware of the fact that I'm probably guilty of being too much of a yes man and I'm, I'm working on saying no more. But um, yeah, talk me through that whole relationship and, um, and being uh, a business partner to your life partner because that's obviously something that's very close to my heart as well. 
Yes. So here's here's what I would imagine. I would imagine that your wife, when she knows that you're, you know, all in, incredibly passionate about something, she believes that it's an opportunity that may be a little bit of a risk, right? But it's something that can propel you. It's going to fulfill you. I'm sure she gets behind you, right? 1000%. I'm sure she gets behind you. This is exactly how my wife shows up for me and how in turn I show up for her. And what was interesting is that this was so, you know, when I st it was easier for her to say, yes, go for 45 days than it probably was. For, and I'm just assuming for her to liquidate her entire retirement fund to support the business, because I remember I, I literally remember when we started the business, I remember talking to friends and family. I, I, I called what I call the kitchen cabinet. Right. Abraham Lincoln. Right. One of our presidents here, he was famous for what he called the kitchen cabinet, where he would pull different. And this is this is actually brilliant. Right. What, what he did is he would pull people from different aisles of the political side. Right. And he would sit them down and they would sometimes they would be in the kitchen of the White House and they would he would put one topic out and he would just let them debate it. Right. And then he would come up with his opinion based on that. So I did the same thing. I brought a lot of my friends in. We sat, we drank beer and, and ate pizza uh, in, our, in our living room, in our dining room. Um, and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to become a matchmaker. And I'm gonna tell you, all of them, with the exception of one of my friends, my dear friend who actually has passed away, uh, they all told me, don't do it. Paul, this is, this is a terrible mistake. This is bad, right? My wife is here, she's listening to this. Family members saying this is bad, right? My wife then goes, after hearing everyone say how bad this idea was, and she says, on top of it, I'm going to liquidate my retirement fund <laughs> and give it to you. Right. You know, Crazy. so so you fast forward when Oprah Winfrey says, I need you for 45 days, she's like, go take him, you know? Like, <laughs> this is an easy one. <laughs> It's so, yeah. uh, and, and they were allowed to visit once. So once during that 45 days, they, they drove down uh, with my brother, uh, drove them down. I saw them for two days, you know, two, three days. And then, you know, that was it. Tricky. Tricky. Well, OK, let's let's fast forward then to um, to celebs go dating and 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 sort of whiz past to, to, to present day. Um, you've obviously just handed in your notice to a, to a certain extent to the show. You've decided not to go back um, to Celebs Go Dating. Is that well, right? Well, 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 actually, this oh, okay. is where this is this this is where the press gets things wrong. Oh, okay. This Sorry, I've got my I've done my research badly there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, you ha you haven't done your research badly. The press ha they did their research terribly. The UK press, and I wouldn't call it the UK press. I mean, let's call it. There's a certain number of publications in the UK yeah. um, that um, that I think get it wrong all the time, um, and they got they got it wrong, and they ran off on multiple stories about me yeah. that are completely untrue. So I didn't put in my notice <laughs> at so what, all. So what's, so what's what's the story? That what's the, what's the real story then? The real story is they took a post of mine. I think this is this is this is my interpretation, right? Is it was a slow news day, right? Because I'm not I'm not really a newsworthy person. I think so. I think it was slow. They took a post, a social media post that I wrote, and they took that post and they interpreted that I was quitting. So so the headlines were. Paul Brunson quits Celebs Go Dating. And the funny thing about that is even the, the production company, even the network didn't even interpret it that way, right? And it was one of those ways, it's crazy. And on, on top of it, I'm, I'm leading another show for the same network, right? And Married at First, Married at First Sight. So it's one of those where... It, 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 to them, they were like, okay, whatever. But the, the, you know, so media took that. And I think that that's part of the issue is that there are a lot of publications that really take just the headline because they know we're only, you know, most people are only going to read the headline, right? 80% of people only read the headline and use that 
as clickbait, right? Or use that just to tell, you know, a certain narrative. So no, um, you know, I, I, I didn't put it in my notice. I love Celebs Go Dating. And it's a show that I feel like between myself and Anna and Tom, we've been able to create something really special. Something that, I mean, we just had our high, the highest ratings we've ever had, you know, for the, for the show. You know, we, 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 I mean, it's one of these where we've created something really special. So yeah. Now, was it a stressful time for me? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we mentioned, you, you, we, uh, I talked about the 45 days, right? For Celebs Go Dating this past series, I had to leave my family for 45 days. Now, what was, what was really challenging for me there is when I was filming Love Town with Oprah, I said to myself at the end, I said, uh, I had a conversation with Jill because you know, my wife came down and we said, never again, if any of us have a project that lasts over 10 days, we will go together as a family, right? We won't separate the family unit. And for 10 years, we kept that intact. I would have a project, she would have a project, etc. We would go together as a family. This was the first time, right? Because of COVID, because of all of the parameters around it, because we were filming in this mansion in Surrey, you know, it was a different format. I couldn't bring them. So I was there for the first time in 10 years and it was highly stressful. It was, um, even dis, you know, despite all the things that I try to do to stay healthy, mentally, physically, it was it still weigh, weighs on you, right? Um, and it got to the point where it was really stressful. So, so me in that uh, social media post that the that the media took, that was me just expressing how challenging it was for me, being transparent about that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's great to be transparent about it. I think we had um, Matt Willis from Busted on the podcast a few episodes ago. And it's really funny hearing you say 45 days and 10 days because he re he regaled a very, very similar story uh, where they had a similar rule, him and his wife, Emma, um, in their family. And Matt was given this chance to uh, support One Direction in Australia, which was a, a six-week tour. And he took it and, it and it put such strain on his family. And, and he said, he said, same as you, I'm never doing that again. Like it's 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 not going to happen. Um, so it's um, yeah. I think having those parameters in place is is super important, but it's sometimes difficult to um, to implement on them, right? Absolutely, it's 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 very it's very difficult, right? And that's where sacrifice comes in. But that's also where why you have to understand your values, and 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 why no truly is the most powerful word. In, 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 in our language is to say no, you know, and it got to a point where I remember thinking to myself, I should just pass on this one. If I can't bring them, I should, I should just pass, right? This is not going to be healthy. This is not going to be good. So, um, yeah, a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons. Tricky one. So yeah, let's, you, you mentioned in that same post about your sort of trifecta of, um, of calm, I guess, um, which it, two of them, two of them, I'm fully on board with. Uh, the the latter one, we we can talk about because it's something that I'm very interested in. But um, you mentioned meditation, exercise, and, and CBD. Um, can you talk a bit to to how you um, how you use those tools? And feel free to go into the detail as much as possible because I think that's where the um, where the benefit is for the listener. But um, how you use those tools to remain calm and stable in in more. Uh, Troublesome times, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have, so I would say for the last seven years, I've been, I've, I've been very proactive in mental health, right? And figure, trying to figure out how I can um, put myself, myself in, you know, going back to actually, it was a great question that you asked before, in terms, like put myself in an optimal state. Right. What can I do to be optimal? And about seven years ago, this was this was during the matchmaking during my matchmaking days here is I noticed that I had a tremendous amount of stress. You know, I was running a business. I had, you know, 12 employees, you know, any anytime payroll comes up, you're like, oh, my God, this is payroll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, ah, right. Um, I was starting to drink a little bit more. Right. Which, which was not good. I, I, I wasn't exercising. You know, it was one of those where I was not in an optimal state. I would get up 
already feeling like I was behind. You know what I mean? Fe like feeling like I was behind. And the whole day was on catch up. I was tired, I was caffeinated, blah, blah, blah. And so I remember exploring different things that I could do. Exercise was the easy one, right? So I started exercising, right? That was the easy one. But then the first thing that I did, I, try, I tried to meditate and I could never successfully meditate. So instead what I did is, I, and I remember I would sit down, I was using like Headspace or an app like that, and I would try to get into this space and I would never be able to get into the space. So I turned my meditation practice into affirmations, right? Saying, literally affirming things over my life. Today, it's gonna to be a great day. And here's the reason why it's going to be a great day. I'm going to learn so much today. Like all this, like I'm going to make payroll, you know, this today or this week, right? Um, yeah, we're, revenue is going to be like, I said all, all these affirmations. After moving from affirmation, it moved into breathing, breathing techniques to start the affirmations. The breathing techniques, I realized, oh my goodness, not only were these breathing techniques helping me to get into this state of calm, it was helping me to get into a state where I can actually meditate now, right? So affirmations, breathing, meditation, right? All in the morning, exercise, all happening in the morning. And then I would add on top of that gratitude, right? Where with the gratitude, what was so important for me was just expressing just my gratitude, you know, to the point where it's just like, you know, hey, I can't wait to come on, come on your podcast. Like this is a this is a blessing. This is this is to have oh, to have you kind. interested. No, it it is. You're 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 interested in in my story, my life, and my lessons. Your listeners are potentially interested, right? All that, that, <laughs> that, that's all a blessing. I, I that's I should be I, that should that's gratitude. So that became that that really helped me. Right. And that's really where it came from. The affirmations, the breathing, the exercise, um, all of that came from, you know, from from that time about seven years ago. And then then it built. Now, you ask about the CBD. The CBD happened about two to three years ago, but it wasn't for me initially. My wife has a, uh, suffers from high anxiety. And we, so, and this was now maybe, uh, it, guys, it all happened around the same time. So around five years ago, we started seeing what, what, what I would call a, a, a Western and slash Eastern doctor, right? So we, we started uh, seeing a holistic doctor and his name is Dr. Shamim. He's actually the oldest holistic doctor in the United States. He's 96 years old. He's from Iran. Um, yes. It, I mean, first consultation blew me away. His consultation is four hours. He stood the entire time. Wow. 96 stood the entire time. Right. Um, he was an MD, right? He was, he was an MD. He was a surgeon here in the United States. And then he switched his practice to holistic. So long story short is, you know, he's going through all these different things uh, to help her and her anxiety. And CBD was one of those that was prescribed, CBD oil. So she would take it and I would see her take it. And, and she would say, well, you know, um, have you thought about this? And I said, no, nah, you know, I don't really, I, I don't really have high, le high levels of anxiety, you know? But then what happened is I started sampling it, right? And I truly realized, oh my goodness, I think I must have had, you know, high levels because despite everything I was doing, despite the meditation, the affirmations, the gratitude, despite all of that, with the introduction of it two to three times a day, I actually felt almost no anxiety. Like I'm talking about to the point where it's, I think it's a little dangerous. Felt no anxiety. <laughs> Superman syndrome. <laughs> yeah, it's like you should feel some anxiety, you know? <laughs> But, but it was none. It was none. Um, and, um, and, and, then, and then it progressed to the point where, you know, um, you know, it was interesting. I have a shoulder injury or a few years ago I had a shoulder injury and uh, uh, used, you know, various CBD oils uh, on the shoulder injury. But 
it's moved to a point where th this becomes almost my practice. Like I feel like, like you know, we all have a practice, um, and that that rounds out my practice. And it's and, I, and and I'm curious to get your opinion on it because I know you're not using it, um, but I was very apprehensive, very apprehensive. But the two things that I'll say that it's done for me, CBD in particular, is, and, and I don't know, this is maybe placebo effect, right? But I've been off of it and on it, and I, and I now feel the difference. But one is that I truly, my, whatever level of anxiety I have, it's, it diminishes, Secondly, is it allowed because the anxiety, because see, it's interesting. Anxiety is thinking about, is fearing about something that's happening in the future. That's what anxiety is, right? Because the anxiety is not there, because I'm not fearing anything that's happening in the future. The second piece is it helps me to be more present. It helps me to be all in. Like when I talk to people, it's interesting. I have to be careful because sometimes they think like I'm trying to come on to them because like I'm I'm all in. You know, I'll sit there. Like, wow. I'll look at hand movements. I'll I'll see. You know, I'll, I'll I'll watch eye fluctuations. I'll listen to tone. Like I'm locked in. You know, but it's beautiful to be locked in. You learn so much more. So that's. That's the reason why. But I'm, but I'm, I'm curious, what, what's been your apprehension behind it? N nothing in particular. Um, I think I'm always apprehensive when something becomes so hot, if you know what I mean. Like it's such, it's such a massive trend right now. And um, a little bit of it, I think, is not knowing where to start because there's just so many products out there. Um, I mean, I'd love to know specifically what brand you use if you've tried different ones and you found one that's the right concentration i think i think it's probably because i'm a scientist i'm thinking very much with my scientific head on and i don't know enough so i fear things that i don't know enough about if that makes sense pharmacology but no. pharmacology was actually my first degree so i should know enough about it but that was many years ago now <laughs> no but, but but what you're saying resonates with me completely because it, it's it's i think it's overdone and a matter of fact, most studies show that when you purchase something with quote unquote CBD in it, you're not getting CBD, you're not getting the right number of milligrams, you're, you know, you're getting low quality. The company that, so I, I use two companies, one in, in, in uh, London and one here in Washington, DC. And the reason why I use two is because you still can't travel with it, right? Uh, so yeah, which is interesting. The one, the company that I use in the States, I absolutely love. I don't know if they ship to the UK, but the reason why I love them is because they test the product. So what they do is they'll, st they'll buy from, you know, various distributors of, you know, CBD distributors. They then test it, right, in a lab. And then they confirm that it has, it includes what it says it includes. And that company is called Life Patent, Life Patent. Patent. And I absolutely adore them. The other thing that I've learned, and I'll just throw this out is, you know, a lot of people are on quote unquote CBD, but there's also CBDA, right? Which there's a difference. CBDA is more of the full spectrum, or call full spectrum. It's basically the entire, you know, plant, if you will, minus With the th th Minus the THC. Okay. M minus the THC. Uh, however, you know, there are various forms that have, you know, 0.02% or that kind of thing. So very small amounts of the THC, which by the way, I can't deal with THC. You know, I'm Jamaican. People have given me marijuana my entire life. I, I, I can't deal with it. I can't deal with the THC. The CBD though, oh my goodness, it helps me to focus. So what you'll know if, well, if you study this is there's people will take CBDA or they'll take CBD, but most scientists tell you that taking CBD plus CBDA gives you the full gives you the full spectrum, right? Gives you the and, and so the the mixture that I use is actually the highest mixture. It's CBD plus CBDA, and I get that from Life Patent, and it is it's game changer, and, and it's called full spectrum. So so that's what I use in the states. 
And then when I'm in London, there's a company called the uh, London Botanist. And the London Botanist, the, I, I've tested lots of different companies. To me, they're one of the highest quality. Um, and uh, I'll get everything from CBD oils to uh, uh, rubs, uh, CBD chocolate. You know, I have a glass of port wine and uh, some CBD chocolate. Well, there, so, there are companies. There are companies now. I, they actually slid into my DMs this week. Um, I obviously have a toothpaste brand myself, a, a plastic-free toothpaste brand. But um, a, another toothpaste brand contacted me with a CBD toothpaste, which is quite interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, it's in everything, right? <laughs> it's in everything. But but to your point, though, it is being overdone, and also uh, I think that. When you get to those trace amounts, those small amounts, you know, one milligram or whatever of CBD, just so they can promote it as a CBD product. Yeah. To me, that's never been effective. You know, that's it's never issue. put me in, in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, funnily enough, the, the gentleman who I had on the on the previous episode to you, he's an ultra marathon runner. Um, and he did a hundred, he had, he did 850 miles in 16 days, which still blows my mind. It's about 60, 60 miles a day. Um, but he, he put his, uh, his performance in that down to, down to CBD oil and, and CDB bombs as well. So he's, he actually works for a CBD company called, um, Pure Sports CBD. And I think there may be, uh, some, a package waiting for me at my practice when I go in next week to, to try out my first, my first bit. So I'll let you know how that goes. But yeah, I mean, with, with respect to your routine and, and, and everything else there, it's almost identical to mine. I mean, exercise, meditation and gratitude all first thing in the morning. I wake up at, at 4.45 to get it in um, before my first patient at 8.15. Um, it's, it's so important. And to be honest, I've dropped off a bit since having my second child a few weeks ago. Uh, my routine's been all out, out of whack and it's it's really messed with my emotional status. So I think it's, um, yeah, it, I, when I get back to work, I'll, I'll get back into it again. But I'm, I'm really interested by that CBD um, piece. So we'll definitely check that out. And I'll put the, the names of those brands in the show notes as well. Good deal. Yeah, let me know. Let me know. I'm, I'm really curious. How that I will impacts. do. I will do. <laughs> cool. Okay, let's, um, let's dive back into entrepreneurship a little bit. And you've obviously worked very closely with um with two billionaires in your in your career one being oprah and one being um the turkish gentleman apologies i, I can't pronounce his name accurately, no one can no, have no, you no uh, one i i listened i listened to something from him he's he's involved in hazelnuts right his his company his village was um sells 75 percent of the world's hazelnuts or something mental like that yeah yeah in the black sea actually absolutely he's, he's from a, a small uh, village called garrison Right. Um, in the Black Sea that I visited, and yes, yeah, most most of the world's hazelnuts come from his village. It's amazing, isn't it? So, so I'd I'd love to know. I mean, I personally don't know any billionaires, so I'll take this opportunity to um to see if you've if you've seen any uh, key traits through both those individuals. And I imagine you were you, through those two. You you've been exposed to many more over your career um, that uh, that we could hope to disseminate and, and action upon in our own careers and lives. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so um, one of one of my jobs, uh, you know, because I'm still Jamaican, right? So I still have to have a lot of jobs. <laughs> is uh, is I'm a columnist for USA Today, you know, right, in the mm -hmm. states, and I'm a business columnist. And there, I interview, uh, you know, top world class entrepreneurs. But it just so happens that I've also interviewed more billionaires than any journalist. So I wow. had the opportunity to to work for two and then interview. You know, whole a whole slew of billionaires, and it's it's really interesting. The reason why I'm so intrigued, I think, by by billionaires is it came from working for Oprah and Enver, and the reason why I became fascinated by those two is that they, you know, Oprah and Enver Ugel, right? They are completely different people. You know, one's a woman, one's a man. One lives in the States, one lives in Turkey. One, she made her business in, in media and entertainment. He made his uh, business in education. Different religion, different family structure, different everything, right? Two completely different people, but yet they had the same habits. They had the same, you know, it, I mean, you, you think about, do they have the same? They have the same exact habits, the same exact habits. And it got to a point where it was so mind blowing to me that I would journal 
And I would just scribble down notes, scribble down notes, scribble down notes. And I ended up writing an article that went viral. You know, it's one of the most viewed articles in the of of LinkedIn, you know, period is 20 things I learned working for two billionaires. Right. 20 things I learned work for two billionaires. And I wrote that. That's in part what helped me get my job at USA Today. That's what helped me to be able to interview these other billionaires. Right. But interviewing them, I realized, oh, my gosh, almost all the habits are the same. Right. And, and so, you know, like, what are those habits? What, one of the, the habits that I think people find most interesting and everyone can emulate and I emulate it now is never eating alone. Right. So you think like never eating alone. What is that? Like what? Especially during the pandemic. What are you talking about, Paul? <laughs> but with Oprah, you know, I so after I worked, uh, shot the show with Oprah, what a lot of people don't know, too, is I went on to shoot another TV show with Oprah that uh, the pilot made it on air and then it, it failed miserably. Uh, so I did I did two shows with her. But then in between those shows, you have to go on a, a what's called a road show and sell the show to networks, etc. And so I would be with eating with her dinners, in Chicago and L.A. and New York. And what was interesting is that every time she would have dinner, it would never be alone. She would always have 20, 30, 40, sometimes 60 people, you know, spread out over five, six tables. She would have eating at the same time. And I thought, this is fascinating because Enver Ugel would do the same thing. He would call me and say, Paul, I'm flying in from Istanbul. I'm going to be there tomorrow night. Can you arrange a dinner with 12 people? You try to get the mayor there. Try to get the, the head of the Wizards basketball team there. Try to get the head of the nonprofit organization there, right? He'd have all these different people. And it goes back to actually what you and I were talking about with Abraham Lincoln's kitchen cabinet, right? What they were doing and what they do is they put diverse thought leaders, thinkers, etc., in a room, have them debate out these ideas in front of them. And what it does is it gives them new perspective on ideas, and it also gives them a glimpse of what is going to happen because they have that new perspective, right? When most of us get the news, we go on to BBC or whatever it is, right? And we go and we read the news and what we're reading is everything that's happened in the past, right? If you go on to BBC right now, you go like this, it's, you know, first, the most popular app on, on my phone, I'm going to see everything that's already happened, right? But when Oprah and Enver and these other billionaires sit down with these thought leaders, they're learning everything that will happen in the future. So you think, how can we emulate this? Because we don't like maybe the listeners, they don't know the you know, CEO of this company or the you know, MP of this. But what you can do is you can put together people who are either in your circle or people who are maybe not in your circle, but your peers who can still give you insight into different industry. So here in Washington, D.C., I nor well, this is before the pandemic. I would have what I call Sunday brunch once a month. I would invite eight people. I may not even know them that well. Maybe we're just uh, Instagram friends, right? right? So I've never met them. And I'd bring eight people into the home. I'd bring a chef in, right? So they're, they're getting this great brunch. And we would sit and we will just talk. And I'll learn about, that's how I learned about cryptos, you know, and Bitcoin. Because of, you know, that's how I learned, you know, that's how I actually, you know, fell in love with, with, with art. You know, it's, it's one of these things where this diverse thought comes to the table. So we could do that to this day. I mean, I think the world is going to open up and we'll be able to have dinners, you know, and, and with, with people. <laughs> oh, yeah, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But you can have a Zoom with, with seven people. Just get seven people together. Say, hey, we're, hey, for 30 minutes, we're just going to get together. You know, there's a book called Never Eat Alone, but written by a gentleman named Keith Ferrazzi. And the book actually chronicles this concept. And I didn't even realize that, right, when I was, you know, working for at Oprah Denver. So that's just one of the many, many habits that, yeah. that they have.
That's a brilliant one, though. I, I won't make you list all twenties. Everyone can go and read that. <laughs> they can go read that LinkedIn article. But that's um, that's awesome. I love that. And um, when you're back in London, I'm definitely going to be hitting you up for one of those Sunday brunches. Maybe I'll host it at my house. <laughs> I, no, I would love that. I would love it. You, you mentioned Bitcoin there. Have you um, have you made substantial invest or decent investment into that? I, I'm. Uh, my mates and I have been talking about Bitcoin for so many years now, and I've never pulled the trigger on it. And I'm now thinking, damn it, I'm so, I'm so too late for this now. <laughs> yeah. So, so now that that's when, it, when so when it comes to investing. So I was an invest investment banker, but a lot of people don't also know that. So I had in the states in order to uh, in order to, to buy and sell securities, you have to have a what's called a Series Seven license. So I had a, ser- a Series Seven license, and so. I've always, not always, but you know, since college, I've been, I've kept up with the markets. I have invested a lot. Um, And, you know, we could, and I'd love to talk about stocks if you want to talk about stocks, right? But I've never put any money in cryptos. Never. I still haven't. I I now, I now understand it, but, but, but not, but, but let me, I'll just say this, you know, my best investment, my best investment in life was actually Square. Really? Yeah, Square. It 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 was. It's it's been. It's it's been. It's like uh, maybe Tesla as well. You know, it's one of those where, oh my god, it's it's. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a good game. Yeah, it's been a game. Yeah. See, I, I've always. I, I don't pick. I mean, I don't, again, it comes down to this thing of of not having the knowledge. I've, I've always very much been a of the mindset of sort of index link tracker funds and, and sort of Tony Robbins. I've read Tony Robbins, uh, seven, Se- seven steps to financial freedom many years ago. And, and that really stuck with me that just sort of be in the market because the, the market's always going to, to continue to grow. But if you don't have the education, then, um, randomly picking stocks and shares could be relatively risky without the right information, I guess. Yes, but you know, so let me, I, I think I, I use three pillars to invest. And, and this is what I, you know, advocate to my friends and family. Three pillars, real simple. The first is, can you explain their business model? Like, can you explain it? You know, yeah. to, to like my seven-year-old, you know, can, can you explain it? Do you really understand how they make money? Right? That's one. Secondly is, do you use their product? Right? Yeah. Because if you use the product, then you are going to know when it's not working well, you're going to know what needs to be done, right? So do you use the product, right? Do you consume it? And then third, and this is a little bit of the, on the investment side, but I think this is smart is, do they have a hundred million US in cash, right? Which is very easy to find if you, you Google that. The reason why I think it's important that they have a hundred million plus in cash is it means that when something like a pandemic hits, they're not going out of business. They can sustain themselves, right? right? When trouble hits, they can make payroll. You know what I mean? They, <laughs> there's a lot that you can do with cash. So do they have 100 million in cash? Do you use the product? Can you explain their business model simply? If it meets those three, right? You, you, I, I, I think it's a solid investment if your thought is the long, you know, you're, you're not trying to day trade. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. It's long yeah this is, this is, this um, is all, this is all long haul. I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. I've, uh, you can probably maybe see behind me here, my Peloton bike. Um, I'm obsessed with Peloton. <laughs> oh, yeah. and I just think it's so good. And I mean, I don't know what their, their global spread is, but it's, it's, it's nowhere near. I don't know if it's present in Australia and, and all these other countries. Yeah. I think it's got so much, further to go and I've been thinking I think it's going to grow should I invest should I not but I would imagine it probably fits into your your um three pillars there so um maybe I'll go and uh, pop a little bit on it <laughs> I, I won't blame you if it goes if it goes <laughs> <tits up. laughs> oh, crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah no I like that I like that okay cool um I want to go on to um onto your philanthropic efforts and uh, and just to go back to the start again before we go on to the the give love build hope um foundation you mentioned at the start um that when you were and this is, seems really 
polarized in different sides of the, of the coin here. When you're an investment banker, you're also doing charity work in the evenings with your with your wife, looking after underprivileged kids and, and helping with them with education and that sort of thing. Is that just is that philanthropic side of you just something that's always been there? Is it something that you've worked on? And can you tell us a bit more about the the, the building of schools in, in Jamaica and, and why that's so important to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's always been there. And I think my mother instilled it. You know, I remember being a little boy for Christmas. It's like, okay, wake up, um, thinking, okay, get these gifts under the tree. No, no, no. We're going to the homeless shelter, right? Because we're going to go spend the day there. We're going to, you know, feed the folks there. We're going to play. Like, so it's one of those where she's instilled it. And then I've always done something on that side. You know, even in the worst times of my life, like I think about all the crazy periods of my life, I was always still in, you know, like a mentoring program where I was mentoring kids or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was one of those where I uh, I got I went deeper when I was. So this was after investment banking, working for Enver Ujo. One of the things he really did change my life, like in many ways. But one of the things that he was able to do is he was able to support my philanthropic endeavors. So I was kind of working for him by day, if you will. But then in the evening, he was helping me to fund these programs. So that's one. The second thing that I really learned from him is his business is actually education. So he runs uh, for profit K through 12 schools, universities, prep centers all over the world. His nephew, who is one of my best friends, created the largest school construction company in the world. And I watched him go from first day starting it to today, where he's building, I think he builds like 200 schools a year, right? So I was privy to all of this happening. And then at the same time, I'm passionate about Jamaica, love Jamaica, always go to visit Jamaica every year. And... I started visiting, well, the first thing that got got me into it was my mother's from a small town called Keith, Bush in the Bush. And I remember visiting her town and the school looks like a hut. It looks like a two room hut. Like it's, everything's exposed. There's no running water. There's no toilet, you know, obviously there. These kids, so you think it's it's already in a, in a challenging climate, you know? And then that structure is horrible. It's the worst environment to try to learn, to try to educate. So I remember saying, hey, you know, how much would it cost if you paint this? And they said it would cost, you know, 300 Jamaican, which is like three US or whatever, you know? So I said, oh my gosh, I'll give that to you. Oh, you know, so if you ran a, a power here and I bought a computer, would that help? Oh my gosh, um, if I sent some books over with it, oh my goodness, right? So that's where it started. That's where Give Love, Build Hope started. And then it started to grow to the point where we're at now, where we actually just finished a school. Uh, So we finished Davyton School in Jamaica, and it's a primary school. But what what we did with the school is we didn't build it from the ground up, this last school, is we revitalized it. So we put in, you know, hurricane proof windows, put in toilets, put, uh, fix the roof, right? We revitalize it, new paint and all that stuff. But what we're moving to now is we, and, but the pandemic has now crushed us, but, uh, cause the kids are not back in school, but we want to build the first fully green. So full sustainable school in Jamaica. And, and so we're like, we're, we're that's, that's going to be our next project. Um, but yeah, but 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 so I've been doing that for years, man, for, for years um, and not just in Jamaica, like uh, all over Barbados, you know, uh, every every single I'm in London. I've helped out schools, you know, in, in the UK It's one of those that I don't. Um, uh, broadly, you know, promote Provide. or talk about. Yeah, yeah. On, on social. But uh, but yeah, man, I've, I've been doing that for, you know. Over over ten years, love it. I love it, and that, that sustainable thing is, um, yeah, so important, right? And so so important for the kids to see the value of that at that at that young stage because it's um, it's going to be their planet that we're ruining at the moment. We need to all be working towards that. 
Amen um, on that. One um, one thing that strikes me about you, Paul, is that you you you've got so many projects, many of which don't necessarily all fit into the same bracket. Uh, the, I mean, for example, the school project is 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 in some ways very different to the TV projects, for example. And then you've got the podcast and the community and the university and all these other things. I have three main projects. I have my own dental practice. I have uh, my own toothpaste company and I have my uh, podcast. I'd, I'd love to do more. <laughs> it's a bit of an addiction. But um, there's so many more things that I'd like to do. For example, like my philanthropic efforts are woeful and I'd, I'd love to put more time and effort into that. But I physically don't feel like I've got enough time in the day to, to do any more. Uh, and as I mentioned already, my wife may leave me if I if I add any more to the uh, to the burner. How, how do you and I'm and I'm sure this has been reflected from the billionaires that you've worked with as well. How do you um, how do you build structure into your life pragmatically to to execute on things at a standard that you're happy enough with? Because that's a big thing for me is I'm a, a bit of a micromanager and I, and I always feel like I need control of everything. I'm not happy, for example, for someone to be writing copy on my social media posts. I want to be in control of all of those elements. Um, how do how do you how do you relinquish control sufficiently, but but still maintain excellence in in a diverse number of projects? Quite a, yeah, a loaded question, but no, but that that is such, such a great question, and it's it's something that I continually battle with. You know, um, I, I say that you know it's interesting. We've probably talked about half of the projects that I I'm actively involved in, just half. And I'm sure people are thinking, oh, my God, like, what in the world? And he has two kids and blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, but I've also had the blessing of now basically 10 years of shaping this life. Right. So even even, for example, we were almost all kids are at home being homeschooled now because of the pandemic. But we were homeschooling our boys before the pandemic. So, therefore. They, we could travel together as a unit, right? Because we were living in, in the UK, you know, for, for, for so many years. So that's part of changing the structure of the family. I'm sorry. This is part of stepping outside of what people consider to be normal, right? And figuring out what is best for you, opposed to what is normal to society, right? That's, that's very important. You know, everyone works out of home now. So the fact that, you know, we're, we're doing this digitally, oh, this is common day. When we launched our matchmaking company, it was entirely digital. People thought we were crazy. We were the first matchmaking agency, I believe, in the world where you didn't walk in to see us. We saw you on video. People were like, what? I mean, this was before Zoom. Yeah. This was literally before Zoom launch. I was one of the beta users on Zoom. Really? Because we were trying to figure out different technology to use, right? So that was us stepping outside of what was normal and figuring out what's normal to us. So for me, you'll be surprised, you, maybe you won't be shocked to know this is, I actually don't work or I don't consider my, I don't, I, I don't, like I used to work 100 hours a week, literally, I used to work 100 hours a week. Cut it back to 75. I probably work 40 to 50 hours a week. I only take meetings actually between, actually you're my first for the day here in the US, right? I take it between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m. EST only on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Fridays, I reserve to meet with my teams, the, lead, the various leaders of, of, of my teams. Saturday, I may do some work, but on a Monday, Sunday, I, I no meetings, no nothing. Even if the Pope called me, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't, I can't do it. Right now, you talked about structure, and you also, t and I, and I, I thought was really good about what you just asked is at a standard, right? That I, that I appreciate. So I've worked very hard on structure. So I, I literally have about 25 people who work for me, either full time, part time, or contract. So it's a fairly good team you know, to handle everything that needs to be handled. But there's certain things that I just keep, like my social media. I'm sorry, I can outsource that. But to me, it's about listening and engaging and that's my voice, et cetera, right? So that, that's part of it. So have the team. The other thing 
that I've learned over the years, and this is the this has probably been my biggest lesson. It's okay to not operate at the highest standard. It's okay. That's what I've taught taught myself. It's okay. I used to be such a stickler for detail. This can't launch until everything is perfect. That blah blah blah. <laughs> now I'm just like, oh, I'll just do it. And maybe that's yeah. the CBD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, man, just do it. Just put it out so, there, so chilled. <laughs> right, there we go. That's the answer that I just need to get the CBD and then I'll chill out. <laughs> All my teams will be so happy. <laughs> right. People are like, this is the best toothpaste ever. You know? <laughs> but um, but but that that that's that's also been, you know, been been part of it where I'm I'm willing to do that. The last thing too is my projects seem all over the place but there's actually one through line. And that is, is that they all involve teaching. So I don't take anything on unless it is me actively sharing experiences, teaching, empowering, you know, lifting someone up. This is the through line. And if it doesn't have that piece, I don't take the project. Interesting. So is that, is that what you view to be your, your life's purpose? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I've, I've figured it out. It's taken me, you know, the, the, actually moving to London has really helped me. But I, I think I was, I was put on, on this earth to teach, you know. Um, and and, and um, the, the other thing that I'll throw out too about the projects, I think this is something, I interviewed um, Swizz Beats, right? Um, and he said something that has really stayed with me over the years. And that is, is because he's doing all these projects with his wife, Alicia Keys, right? They're always doing all these projects. And I said, how do you deter, like every day you must get 10 different offers. How do you know what to say yes to? And he said, I only take on projects where I believe my participation will make it historic. I thought, wow, that's, that's really deep. So this is what I do, is that part of my litmus test is I'll say, okay, is this project, does it involve teaching, right? Imparting information. And then secondly, will my role on this project, will it be historic? Will it, will, will, will it create something new, right? It, it, every project, even like Married at First Sight UK, right? I remember saying, okay, my, if, if I take this, what about what I'm doing is going to be historic, right? And I remember sitting down with my manager and the, and the production team, and they were like, you're going to be the first black host, you know? you can help to change, you could reshape how we're doing the matching process here, right? If you get the, if, if you get the results that you think you can get, that's going to be historic. And we were blessed the last Married at First Sight UK, we got a 75% success rate, the highest success rate of any Married at First Sight franchise in the world. There are 29 of these shows wow. in the world. We have the first Married at First Sight UK baby on its way right now. <laughs> That's amazing. That was historic. So to me, like, yeah, I want to be part of something where I can be historic in that and I can teach. Yeah. So that's part of how I decide if I'm going to do it. Love it. Love it. Okay, well, I mean, I, we could carry on all, all, all evening here, but uh, and I'm, I think we're probably gonna have to get you back on at some point for a round two. But uh, I'm going to finish now with a question that I asked everyone um, at the end of this show, which is, what's the one small change that uh, you wish you'd made earlier in your life? Man, all right. This is maybe going to sound egotistical, but no, nah, I wouldn't change anything, man, because it's all a lesson, really, straight up, real facts, like 100%. I, they're... they're I, I could say, man, I, I, I wish I could have done that. But then if I didn't do that, I might not have learned this new thing that's now impacted my life. I view life as we are accumulating data, right? Life, life, life is simply making decisions. That's, that's really all it is. Every, we have moments and we have to make a decision in those moments, right? And you add all of that up, that's your life. Now, how do you determine in the moment if you're going to decide yes or no, left or right? It's based on data, 
that you possess. Where do you get that data? You could read about it. You could listen. You know, you can be counseled and coached. But the data also comes from your life experience. So when things happen to you that you feel, oh, I wish that didn't happen or that hurt. The real question is, what can you pick up? What can you learn? What data can you get from that so that in the next moment you'll make a better decision? So that's that's exactly how I look at it. Love it. What a, what a great way to, to end the show. Well, Paul, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, as I say, I really, I, I'm sure the listeners have learned an incredible amount there. And um, yeah, as I say, we'll have to get you back on for um, for a round two sometime in the future. Hopefully in person. Um, when, you, when, when are you back in London? Yeah, listen, I, I'm, I'm back in three weeks. Oh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we could do some CBD together. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. C- CBD cocktails or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Some CBD chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, mate. All the best. Good stuff, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.